production efforts. You're up, Carolyn, go ahead. Raise your hand if you enjoy walking in the forest around Blacksburg. Me too. Uh, these natural areas out there can seem relatively untouched by humans, but with a closer inspection, uh, it reveals that the landscape is quite different than it used to be, even like 100 years ago. Before the turn of the 20th century, the eastern half of the United States was dominated by the American chestnut tree. The American chestnut grew on over 200 million acres in the eastern United States, from Maine to Florida. An estimated 4 billion American chestnut trees grew within this range, and in some areas, one in every four hardwood trees was chestnut. Mature trees often reached 100 feet tall, with a diameter about chest height 14 feet uh, was relatively common. And the trees were uh, root straight and branch free for about 50 of that 100 feet, uh, making them a great tree for lumber. Uh, and the chestnut lumber industry was a major sector of rural economies. The wood is straight grained, easy to work, and beautiful. Used for home construction, barn building, musical instruments, wood floors. Uh, it was rock, very rock resistant, so it worked well for all those things. The chestnut was also uh, an essential component of the entire eastern U.S. ecosystem. So uh, the American chestnut used to produce about a 20 million pound nut crop annually. It was the single most important food source for animals, from bears to squirrels, and it was really important food source for uh, rural communities. This was all the case until about the year 1900, when the chestnut blight first showed up in the United States. The blight enters the tree trunk, and then grows under the bark and forms these open cankers on the outside of the tree. So the cankers end up spreading around the whole cambium and killing, killing the tree and um, leaving dead trees standing. The disease decimated entire forests and it left billions of mature trees uh, just, like I said, standing. Uh, so the people and the animals that once relied heavily on these forests and the resources of the chestnut had to figure out something different. The chestnut blight spread as far as 50 miles in a year, and by 1926, the blight had been reported throughout the entire range. By 1950, the tree was essentially gone. So only, the only chestnuts that survived were the ones that were planted outside of this range, or some trees that retained resi genetic resistance somehow, so there's a few around. So is it possible to reintroduce this tree back into our forests? Could the tree actually begin to fill the void that was left behind over half a century ago um, just by efforts of, of humans? Um, there's an organization called the American Chestnut Foundation that set out to do just this. It's their mission to restore the chestnut to eastern forests for the benefit of animals, the environment, and society. They have uh, offices throughout the eastern United States through the range and then there are chapters in each state that are run by volunteers mostly. In 1989, ACF founded their first research farm down in, in southwest Virginia to develop a blight-resistant American chestnut tree. And their aim was to breed a hybridized tree. So ACF developed a bat cross breeding program that cross-pollinates Chinese chestnuts with their American chestnut cousins. The trees are quite different in appearance, but the Chinese chestnut is naturally resistant to chestnut blight. So what they set out to do was to develop the American-Chinese hybrid that looks and acts like an American chestnut, but maintains the blight resistance of the Chinese chestnut. The goal of developing a 15th, 16th American chestnut. So to, to develop this hybrid takes many years, many back cross pollinations, and each back cross taking about a minimum five years to complete. So, at the first cross, you get a 50-50 tree. Um, and then the trees are crossed back again with American chestnut, American chestnut, uh, until you get to the 15th, 16th American chestnut with that 1 16th showing blight resistance. These breeding orchards are popping up, up and down uh, the eastern United States, uh, so they can capitalize on pollinating these new trees with the regional genetics of wherever uh, they're growing the trees. So you're not trying to grow a uh, chestnut from Maine in Florida. So at the Catawba Sustainability Center, we've partnered with ACF to develop a 
an American chestnut backcross breeding orchard that develops trees with Catawba genetics. And the project is supported by the American Chestnut Foundation, Virginia Tech, and the local land care organization, Catawba Land Care. Carl Absher lives in the Catawba Valley. He identifies several different uh, locations of American chestnut trees that had survived. Uh, because the trees are so far apart, Carl goes out and hand pollinates them uh, and then takes the seeds and plants them. And all those trees will likely succumb to the blight. This year, Carl and a group of volunteers, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, so we're taking these Catawba genetic trees and we're developing a backcross breeding orchard at the Catawba Sustainability Center. So Carl went out this year uh, with the help of the Virginia Tech Electric Service, um, <laughs> one of their trucks and two of their employees for two days wow. to bag and pollinate these trees. And then when our trees at the Sustainability Center get to the right stage, we'll back cross those hybrids with the Catawba trees to get these regional genetics that we're looking for. Our goal here, this is the Sustainability Center, is to develop a 400 to 600 tree back cross breeding orchard. We just started this two years ago, so our final product is still several years out. I remember five years per back cross, and we've got six, five more back crosses to go. Um, but uh, we'll make it. And this is just one of the many things we're doing in Catawba. Uh, we have some really exciting and cool things happening out there. And uh, I encourage you to look us up and get in touch and uh, set up an appointment or something.